Let's turn in our Bibles tonight to uh, Joshua chapter 11. As the Israelites are continuing in their conquest of Canaan, and uh, chapter 11 deals with the defeat of the northern kings. Verse 1, And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard these things, or those things, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to king Shimron, and to king Ashpath, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains, and to the plains uh, south of Chinneroth, and in the valley, and in the border, borders of Dor on the west. So the, the, the plains of Chinneron here, Chinneroth that are mentioned, they're near the Sea of Galilee. And to the, verse 3, and to the Canaanite on the east and on the west, and to the Amorite and the Hittite, and the Perizzite and the Jebusite in the mountains, and to the Hivite under Hermon uh, in the land of Mizpah. And they went out, they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the sea, seashore in multitude with horses and chariots very many and when all these kings were met together they came and pitched together at the waters of miram uh, to fight against israel um, so the northern kings now are hearing about israel's victories uh, victories in the south and they decide to do something about it they gather their, their armies together to defeat uh, Israel now to stop them now or figure they'll never be able to stop them and Israel certainly faces greater challenges than ever before because the northern kings they have a great army all these kings gathered together uh, they had superior what we'd call technology for the day they had a lot of horses they had a lot of chariots and uh it seems like the, the challenges that Israel faces now increase at every step from Jericho to Ai and uh, battle with the southern kings, battle with the northern kings. And sometimes as we walk through the world with the Lord as Christians, it seems like challenges can increase with every step. It seems like maybe we go three steps forward and two back. And, and But uh, God uses victory as a springboard sometimes to strengthen us and to, to cause us to trust more for the next battle that's coming. Now, we know that Jesus gave us the victory. Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, But when we walk in victory, when we're victors, when we're victorious, it means we're targets you know we're we're kind of like the uh i remember seeing a joke years ago two deer are standing together in the edge of the forest and one of them's got a big bullseye and on his side and the other looks at him and says boy bummer of a birthmark <laughs> al you know and the idea is we as christians we kind of have a target on us and uh, much of the world sees us and certainly the devil sees us because he notices righteousness in us hopefully and he hates righteousness. He doesn't. We're, we're made in God's image, and God calls us to be righteous in His sight. And uh, we need to be ready for the attacks like good soldiers. In verse six, he goes on and says, "And the Lord said to Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time I will deliver them up all slain." Before Israel, thou shalt hock their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So God brings encouragement to Joshua because he's he's fearfully. I mean, you look in the physical sense here. This is a huge army and uh, he gives him encouragement as we we can get encouragement continually and constantly from Jesus. Um, Because it seems sometimes like new attacks come, whether they be health or relatives or, or so called friends. And uh, we can have difficulty, difficult challenges facing us each day. But God allows these things into our lives. And it's not without reason. Nothing comes without reason. And he's assuring Joshua here, don't be afraid. You know, don't keep your eyes on this thing. Keep your eyes on me. And because uh, he, 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 he's fearing this great, big, well-equipped army. And uh, sometimes uh, overcoming the challenges that are in front of us can seem impossible. It could be illness could be a mortgage payment for some people. As I said recently, we just paid for someone to stay somewhere because they had no place to stay. Uh, we could have uh, opposition from a relative, a neighbor, a boss. We could have a date that's approaching that's, oh, we're looking at with trepidation. 
I like Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, and who of whom shall I be afraid? You know, circumstances aren't the thing here. That's what we focus on, but he wants us to focus on him. Verse 7, so Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Miram suddenly, and they fell upon them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them unto great Zidon, and unto Mizraf Othmam, and into the valley, unto the valley of Mizpah eastward. And uh, they smote them until they left them none remaining. Uh, this Mez, uh, Mizrafoth. Mayim. <laughs> it's a hard one to pronounce. It's a tongue twister. It means salt pits. It's the burning waters. And uh, verse 9, Joshua did uh, unto them as the Lord bade him. He hawked their horses and burnt, burnt their chariots with fire. And to hawk or to hawk, haw their horses, it just it means to hamstring. Uh, one of them is to cut the hamstring behind the hoof so they can't walk. The other is to, you can actually lock the leg, legs together with rope or with a, uh, a kind of handcuff, but it'd be a leg cuff, wouldn't it? So uh, so Jack, Joshua's attacking the uh, northern army, surprises them with an ambush, defeats them, and uh, comes out with, he has a strategy the Lord's given him. He's bold about it. And he fought uh, obediently, doing just what the Lord told him. And he also destroyed the Canaanite weapons, the weapons which would be horses and, and chariots, and didn't take any of them into his own army, because the Lord said not to. And uh, I guess, you know, one of the lessons we can get to, from this is don't use the devil's tools. Um, I think of condescending sar sarcasm as a really good tool that the devil has that we use sometimes. Intimidation, bullying, uh, manipulation, putting ourselves first. Bully uh, yeah, bullying has said that. Instead, that we believe that God will fight our battles and battle on a different level, a level of complete trust in him. That's where we should be. And um, we just went through Ephesians. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of wickedness, of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So Joshua's fighting. He's, he's doing what the Lord's called him to do. He's got commitment until the job's done. Paul addressed this. He says, don't get weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And Timothy, you know, Paul and Timothy, it was sometimes used uh, battling terms, sometimes track and field kind of things of the Olympiad. But in Timothy, uh, Timothy, First uh, Timothy six twelve, he said, "Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses." So we're in a battle. We know this is the battlefield we're in. God gave us a beautiful one, but it's still a battlefield for souls. Verse 10. And Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword. For Hazor, uh, before time, was the head of all those kingdoms. And they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe, and he burnt Hazor with fire. And all the cities of those kings and all the kings of them did Joshua take and he smote them with the edge of the sword and he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them, save Hazor in it only that did that did Joshua burn. So uh, those cities that were easily defended on the hills, he kept, he didn't destroy them. But the ones that the cities that uh, are not easy to defend, those are ones in the valleys. He destroyed them. In verse 14, in all the spoil of these cities and the cattle, uh, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. Neither left they any to breathe. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did jo uh, Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So uh, it's a complete destruction here. And uh, God's destruction, his judgment is complete here without mercy on this, these heathens. Uh, it, it really is the way we should be dealing with sin 
And I know he's dealing with sinful creatures, but here we should be dealing with sin with no mercy, not let it into our lives in any fashion whatsoever. In verse 16 now. So Joshua took all that land, the hills and all the south country and all the land of Goshen and the valley and the plain and the mountain of uh, Israel and the valley of the same, even from the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took, and smote them, and slew them. And Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, all other they took in battle. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly, and they might, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. So he's showing how he worked in Moses' life and now in Joshua's. So here, Israel is, they're secure in Canaan now. It's a complete victory. They've conquered the north and the south. And you know, notice he said that God hardened the hearts of the heathens. Uh, but uh, often the Lord will give us over, we who have a hardened heart, to the sin that is in that heart. In, in chapter 1 of Romans, it deals with the heart of mankind in our fallen condition. I want to read verse, verses 24 through 28 of Romans 1. Uh, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. And that's often true of the pagan cultures. They worship the sun and the moon and the stars and, and the earth and the animals and, and everything, the water. And uh, God wants to himself to be worshipped, the creator, not the creature. And verse 26 of Romans 1, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, in other words, heterosexuality he's talking about here, burned in their lust one toward another. Homosexuality. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error that which was meet or appropriate. In other words, the, er the punishment for sodomy. And even, verse 28, as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to those, do those things which are not convenient. In other words, when we put our heart in that position where we won't give in to the Lord, he'll allow us to be just turned over to that, that sin. So the thing about God's grace, it, it, it can really soften a heart as we see what Christ did on the cross and died and gave his life for us. But many, when they look at God's grace and his righteousness and sometimes his justice too, it hardens their heart toward God. They'll say, oh, I can't, I can't worship and serve a God like that. Well, there's only one God, and he puts forth what he is, and, and uh, we need to be obedient to, to that alone. Verse, uh, let's see, where are we? Verse 21. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, <clears throat> and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua de destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remained. So Israel feared the Anakim, uh, it was a tribe of very large people, very strong. It, looked, it would look like the NBA, National Basketball Association, seven, eight-footers. They were giant people. They were strong. They were great warriors. In fact, this is spoken of in Numbers 13. I'll read you a few verses. It says, They went and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto <coughs> all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We came into the land where you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, 
The people are strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Anakins. The, the Amalekites dwell in the land to the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw are men of great stature. And there were... There we saw giants, the son of Anak, which came, uh, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were they in their sight. So uh, they were fearful. And as, uh, forty years later, the Anakim will fall um, because they're they're no match for an army that's blessed by God. There's no they're no match for an army that's directed by God. They're no match for an army that's obedient to God, and. Uh, Israel faces the Anakin last after God has trained them through a lot of battles previously to get them ready and got them used to working with him, got them used to obeying him and letting him do the work. And months of conquest going on here. And he knows she knows how to get them ready and how they to get them to handle the battles of life as the same way he knows how to strengthen us and train us to get used to the battles of life. And uh there's a lesson in here that uh, he saved the Anakims for last because that was the bigger one. And, and we sometimes tend to battle the big ones first. And he says, you got to get your training on the smaller ones. He wants to face the big ones last so that uh, we'll be more prepared. And then back, and we're back in verse, or chapter 11 here, verse uh, 22. There were none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod that remained. So they, they're Anakim here. They, they remain in the coastal cities occupied by the Philistines. It's interesting, 500 years later, there would be someone who came from Gath. You ever heard of Goliath of Gath? This is where he came from. 500 years later, it says in 1 Samuel 17, 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath whose height was six cubits in a span. A cubit is about a foot and a half. That makes him nine feet plus a span. Nine, eight, maybe. My span's about eight inches. Big guy. Verse 23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. And the land rested for more. So we have a complete victory here. Israel's resting after this war, uh, resting from the war. The, the power that the, the Canaanite kings held over this area has been crushed. But they didn't wipe out every small town and village. Uh, and God actually gave them the land, but the, the tribes that went in would have to clean up that land if there were any left behind. They'd have to finish the job in the land that was given them. So we, we can know that Christ has defeated the enemy at the cross. He, he's taken the teeth out of, of the devil. And, uh, but uh, we sometimes... He's given us the land, and sometimes we just have to take what we've already, what is already ours. Chapter 12, um, a short account of the conquest here and a list of the conquered kings of both Moses and Joshua. Interesting. Um, we're going to look at Moses' conquest, Joshua's conquests, and then the names of uh, 31 kings conquered by Joshua. I won't read through those, but uh, we'll do most of it here. Verse 1 through 6 in uh, Joshua 12. Now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side of Jordan toward the rising of the sun from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon and, on the plain, and all the plain on the east. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and ruled over Eror, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, and from the middle of the river, and from half Gilead even unto the river Jabbok, 
which is the border of the children of Ammon. And from the plain to the Sea of Chinneroth on the east and to the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea we call, on the east, uh, the way to Beth, Beth Jeshemoth, and from the south, Ashdoth Pisgah. And the coast of Og, king of Bashan, uh, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Edri, and reigned in Mount Hermon in Salca and in all Bashan uh, under the border of the Geshurites and the Maacarthites and uh, half Gilead, and the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Them did Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it for a possession unto the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh. So kings def defeated by Moses, he's mentioning here. Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan. Uh, uh, the first kingdom of Sihon and Og are on the east side of the Jordan. And as they're, they're looking back toward uh, the rising of the sun, he makes a reference to the rising of the sun. And uh, Moses gave the land to Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh. And so half the tribe of Manasseh lived on the east side of the Jordan and half lived on the west side of the Jordan. And uh, why such a detailed list? Well, uh, it, it answers the question of what land belongs to Israel, according to God, not according to mankind necessarily. But uh, today there's still unrest in the Middle East, uh, uh, warring over who owns what land, whose land is whose, and, and uh, the Palestinians and the Arabs are fighting over Israel's land. Will there ever be peace? Probably not. Uh, will they ever take Israel's land? No. <laughs> I think God's determined that it's theirs, and I think it's going to stay theirs. Verse 7 in chapter 12, and these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side, Jordan, on the, uh, on the west, from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, even unto the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for a possession according to their divisions, in the mountains and in the valleys and in the plains and in the springs and in the wilderness and in the south country. The Hittites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I think of uh, God made a promise back in Exodus 3.8. He says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. So we see here uh, in Joshua a fulfillment of that promise. Now, verses 9 through 24 names 31 kings that were conquered by Joshua. If you want to do a name study of your own, you're welcome to do that. But I'm not going to read down through those. So, uh, but what he does is he recounts 31 kings that were conquered by Joshua. This isn't a once upon a time thing. You know, it's not a, not fairy tales here. These are real places. These are real people. These are real rulers. And that's the thing about the Bible. You can go back to that land and you can find artifacts. You can find, uh, the land that was, uh, where these things took place. And, uh, God documents for, uh, Israel, this is all to document what God has done for them. So that years later, they could remember what God had done to them. They could tell their children what God had done to them. And uh, there's certainly in all of our own lives, there's good that we can reflect upon. There's good things that we can remember. The things that have been conquered by God's grace. I think well, many of us can say that we're here by God's grace. I shouldn't be here. In my own understanding, in my own foolishness, back years ago before I got saved, I shouldn't have survived a lot of that. By, but by God's grace, I am here. And uh, he says that all the kings and enemies were conquered. All the principalities and powers of the land were defeated. No doubt in my mind, that those who believe the Bible know that the land belongs to Israel. But there's individual work that still has to be done, just like the sins in our own lives. There are many things that we have to still work out. There's work to do to possess our own lands if, in, in that sense. Oh, last chapter here. 
the remaining land allotments east of the Jordan. Uh, verse 1. This is chapter 13. Now Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said to him, you're old and stricken in years. <laughs> I like that. And there remains yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth. All the borders of the Philistines and all Geshurai, from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the border of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite. Five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, I'm sorry, the yeah, the Gazathites and the Ashdathites and the Ashkelonites Eshkel and the Gittites and the Ekronites and also the Avites. Obviously, I should have practiced these words a little more. <laughs> I did go through them, but from the south, all the land of the Canaanites and Mira that is beside the Sidonians and Aphek unto Aphek to the borders of the Amorites in the land of the Giblites in all Lebanon toward the rising from or the sun rising from Baal Gad unto Mount Hermon unto the entering of Hamath. So sometimes the battles never seem to end. I mean, even as we get older, the, the battles get old and get keep coming. And sometimes they seem to get more intense as we get older. But the thing about that is I find that I'm stronger in the Lord and I can face greater things even though I'm tireder and weaker than I was when I was younger, emotionally and spiritually, we get stronger. We have, uh, we have more spiritual strength that we are more able to, to withstand the enemy and to fight the enemy. And, and no matter what we've done and what we've been through, God wants us to keep moving on, keep pressing on. You know, this whole concept of retirement, I love the idea, but it's an American idea. Most people in the biblical times, they just kept going. Well, I think I find that what God will do with a lot of pastors, they, they don't little, literally retire. What we do is we shift and we do other things. If the God calls us out of the pulpit, we may go somewhere else and do something else. But the idea of retiring, of stopping doing everything and just setting back. I remember watching people at Kodak many years ago uh, would retire and they'd go home and sit. And a high percentage of them were dead within a year. There was nothing to do. They just Their whole thing was their, their work. But uh, for us as believers, there's always work to do. We always got work to do. There's always more people to witness to. There's more to share all the time. And we need to keep on keeping on. Okay, verse 6. All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon unto Mizrafoth Mayim. How about that one? Mizrafoth Mayim. And all the Sidonians, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. Only divide thou... Uh, thou it by lot unto the Israelites for an inheritance as I have commanded thee. So this is God's method for possessing the land. He says, uh, God promises, he says, look, I'll drive them out. And, and I want each of you tribes that go in there, I want you to trust me in this. But at the same time, you're my hands and feet. And, you know, the, the tribes, they had a responsibility to complete this possession of the land. Uh, they must exercise their own responsibility and initiative, trusting that God would do what he's called them to do. In other words, strengthen them and uh, to conquer them. Uh, that's how things get done. People get blessed. We get blessed as we serve doing what God's told us to do. And uh, God is sovereign. His will is always done. We don't we don't will it over God. We, we you know we pray what we think how we think things should work out, but we pray that He will bless us, and we certainly want Him to get the glory in all of it. That's the whole idea. Verse seven. I'm going to read all the way to thirteen. Now therefore divide this land for an inheritance unto the nine tribes, and half the tribe of Manasseh, with whom the Reubenites and the Gadites have received their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond Jordan eastward, even as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. From a rower that is upon the bank of the river Arnon, and the city that is in the midst of the river, in all the plain of Mediba unto Dibon, and all the cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who, which reigned in Heshbon, under the border of the children of Ammon, and Gilead, and the border of the Geshurites, and the Meacathites, and, uh, and all Mount Hermon. I wish I had maps up here so we could point, you know, as we went, but uh, I don't. And all Bashan unto Selka, all the kingdom of Og and Bashan, which reigned in Asher, 
Ashtaroth and in Edrei, who remained in the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses smite and cast them out. Nevertheless, um, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites nor the Maacathites, but the Geshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. Interesting. The land allotments in the land divisions east of the Jordan among Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh, the land of King Sihon of the, the Amorites and King Og of Bashan. There were only two small tribes that weren't replaced by Jewish tribes on the east side of the Jordan. It says the Geshurites and the Maacathites. Interesting. Just a piece of trivia here. David, King David, would later marry a princess from Geshur. And she had a son. His name was Absalom. Interesting. Second Samuel 3. I'm going to read you three verses. Now, first three verses. Now, there was a, this is Second Samuel 3. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were his sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and his second Chiliab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite, and third Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. So Absalom later would return to Geshur and used it as a place to plot against his father David. And you can read about that in 2 Samuel 13 and 14. I'm not going to go through that tonight. But the Maacathites may have come from Maacah, who was a nephew of Abraham, spoken of in Genesis, way back in Genesis 22. So, verse 14 here of uh, chapter 13. Only under the tribe of Levi gave none, he gave none inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord, God of Israel, made by fire are their inheritance, as he said unto them. So the tribe of Levi was in a unique situation. They received no province like the other tribes. Instead, their inheritance was the offerings that Israel would bring to the Lord. Uh, their, uh, that was their financial security, so to speak. Verse 15, I'm going to read through 23. And Moses gave unto the tribe of the children of Reuben inheritance according to their families. And their coast was from Eroer, that is on the bank of the river Arnon, in the city that is in the midst of the river, in all the plain of Mediba, Heshbon and all her cities that are in the plain, Dibon and Bamoth Baal, Beth Baal Mion, and Jehaza, and Kadimoth, and Ms. Mephath, or Mephath. And Kirjiathaim, Sibma, Zarathathathathathar, <laughs> in the valley of, in the mount of the valley, and Beth Peor, and Ash doth Pisgah, and Beth Jesh Imoth, and all the cities of the plain, and all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses smote with the princes of Midian. Evi and Recham and Rezur and Hur and Reba, which were dukes of Sihon dwelling in the country. You might recognize a few names in here. Balaam also, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. And the border of the children of Reuben was Jordan, and the border thereof, the border thereof, this was the inheritance of the children of Reuben after their families, the cities and villages thereof. In other words, the portion of Reuben's land. And then verse 4, 24 to the end of the chapter. And Moses gave inheritance unto the tribe uh, of Gad and unto the children of Gad according to their families. And their coast with Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and half the land of the children of Ammon under the Aroer that is before Meba, and from Heshbon under Ramoth Mizpah, and Betonim, and Mahanaim and the, under the border of Deber, and in the valley of Beth Aram, Beth Nimrah, and Succoth, and Zaphon, uh, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon, Jordan and his border, even under the edge of the sea of Chinnereth, on the other side, Jordan eastward. 
This is the inheritance of the children of Gath um, after their families, the cities, and their villages. So he's just telling what the portion of Gath's land was. Verse 29, and, and, and Moses gave inheritance unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, and this was the possession of the half-tribe of the children of Manasseh by their families. Uh, and their coast was from, from Maenam, all Bashan, all the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, threescore cities, and half Gilead, and Ashtaroth, and Edrei, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan, were pertaining unto the children of Maker, the son of Manasseh, even to the one half the children of Maker by their families. These are the countries which Moses did distribute for inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side, Jordan, by Jericho eastward. Um, this is the portion of half the tribe of Manasseh's land. Uh, but unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he had said unto them. So this is more on the inheritance of the Israel or the Levites here. As verse 14 had said, uh, the Levites got no land but they got the sacrifices that uh, Israel brought to God, and that's how they were fed. And uh, if we as Christians are connected to any of the uh, tribes, it would be the, probably the tribe of Levi. Uh, in, in 1 Peter 2.5, Peter calls us priests. He says, you also as live lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ, Jesus Christ. And we have a special inheritance that Paul mentioned in Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. So maybe some of the Jews, the Israelites in those day were, days were dissatisfied with their lot, with their parcel from God. And sometimes we can become dissatisfied and, uh, uh, with our lot, with our parcel from God. We can get angry at God. And, well, why did you make me this way? Why did you put me here? Wish you'd give me something different. And uh, I think it's important that we see ourselves not only as children of God, but as priests of God. And our real inheritance is God himself. He pours his Holy Spirit in us after all. Philippians 4.1, Paul said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be content. That's something we, <laughs> I think we spend our whole lives struggling with. First Timothy 6.6 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, there's, there's so many things that they're easy to understand intellectually, but to have them to slide in, down into our heart and take over our bodies is, is a whole different thing. I have a... Um, a story taken out of Daily Bread. It was years ago. It was in 1994. May 18th, 1994. Here's the story. And I think this is so appropriate uh, in this uh, American society where, you know, we're taught, you know, you work hard and hard and you get more and more and more and more. And you get more successful and you get more stuff. And here it is. A rich industrialist who was disturbed uh, to find, was disturbed to find a, uh, fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. He says, why aren't you out there fishing? He says, well, because I caught enough fish for today. He says, why don't you catch more fish than you need? He said, well, why would I do that? What would I do with them? He said, well, you could earn more money and you could buy a better boat. You could go deeper out there and you could catch more fish. You could, you could buy nylon nets, the nice nylon nets. You could catch even more fish. You could make even more money. You could have more boats. You could have a fleet of boats and you could be rich like me. He said, well, then what would I do? He said, well, you could sit down and enjoy life. He said, what do you think I'm doing now? <laughs> As he looks peacefully out at the sea. You know, I, I, it just it, this story really struck me because we have opportunities to 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 take that attitude. We got to keep going and going and going and get more and more done. But I like what uh, Psalm thirty-seven four says: "Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart." And then a little further on in Psalm thirty-seven and verse seven it says, "Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him, not racing so much." We don't need to gather more. We're doing fine with what he's given.
So, Lord, we thank you <laughs> for your word, Lord, and the strength of your word, and the power and the purity of your word, Lord. And thank you for the examples of Joshua and the Israelites and the things that they did and the things you did through them, in and through them, Lord. And uh, it was important that they realized it was you that's working, Lord. And I do pray that you would help us to see when your hand is in it, when you're working in and through us, Lord, because without you we can do nothing, but we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. Thank you, Lord, for those words. In Jesus' name, amen.